I want to go back to Corey and ask because part of the way you frame this issue is that there are um, eras. I forget what what term you used. Uh, Regime. Regimes. Regimes, yeah. right? There are different regimes, and that president. <laughs> So nobody can, be mad. nobody can be mad at me <laughs> this time. Glenn, Glenn gave him a hard time last week. That there are there are regimes um, that a president inherits. And um, if a president is aligned with a regime that's go on its way out the door, then they become a weak president and this is hurtful to them. What do you perceive to be the status of the regime that Donald Trump inherited? How would you describe that regime and what do you think is coming next? So I do think it's it's really weak. And and I think there are a couple of ways to think about this. So let's just first look at what was Trump able to kind of accomplish through legislation. And, and I apologize because whenever I bring this kind of stuff up, it sounds incredibly boring and it's not nearly as exciting as militias and, and all the rest of it. But... <laughs> This is a political party we're talking about, and political parties are interested in controlling the state and being able to determine policy. And the fact of the matter is, is that Trump, with the exception of the tax cuts, uh, which is something that you know Republicans can do in their sleep, um, was really not able to get uh, much through Congress at all. The budgets that he passed were Barack Obama's budgets. That doesn't mean that they were super liberal and progressive, and there's a whole conversation about the Democrats and liberalism that we can have, but they were certainly not the kinds of budgets that Republicans want. Paul Ryan wanted to, you know, remember what was his dream, right? He was, you know, they were going to get rid, once they got the tax cuts, they were going to go after Medicare, they are going to go after Social Security, things that he'd been dreaming, you know, since keg parties in college. <laughs> and he couldn't do it. And like, this is really important for people. And this is why I think the historical perspective, like this is where the modern right comes out of is, is to be able to do that kind of stuff. Um, you know, austerity uh, politics is, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens here. I, I don't want to be too quick on this one because the Democrats have a history, a bad history on this kind of stuff. But um, you know, the kinds of stuff that was going on, you know, with, with, with the level of spending and all the rest of it, you know, it was pretty unprecedented. So that kind of stuff, you know, the Republican regime, the language has been really, really weak. Um, and even, you know, and then you can look on things like, so we're going to talk about cultural issues, uh, just to give you two examples, like on immigration. The fact of the matter is Donald Trump was never able to get an immigration bill through Congress, mm-hmm. even when the Republicans totally controlled the Congress. Like they had... Barack Obama was a far more successful president in his first two years than Donald Trump was in his first two years and in his four years. So, but uh, immigrate, you know, immigration bills, we want to talk about cultural politics, was very un- unsuccessful. And just one last I- example of this, mm-hmm. you know, Donald Trump just vetoed, one of his final acts was to de- veto the NDAA, the defense bill. Uh, and then Congress overrode that veto, which is something other presidents had vetoed those NDAAs. None of them were ever overridden. Trump mm. was overridden by his own party. Mm. And one of the big things that Trump said, and again, so we're talking about cultural issues, was that he did not want, uh, he wanted um, uh, military bases that were named after Confederate generals to be continued to be able to be named after Confederate generals. And the, the Congress said, absolutely not. He vetoed the bill and they overrode his veto. So... You know, I, I think when you look at things like wielding of state power, that kind of politics just does not have the potency uh, that it once had. Now, the question of, you know, kind of where we go from here, I think the Republican Party is is really in a tough position right now. Um, I think there is a very emboldened Trumpist base mm-hmm. that we see in, all over the place, mm-hmm. you know, not just in Kentucky and, and Southern California. We see it in Georgia and all the rest of it. But there's another part of the Republican Party, you know, those 70 million voters are not just Trumpist voters. And like most of them were Republicans before Trump. And some of them went, you know, went that way. But, you know, the Washington Post just had a very interesting poll. How do you identify yourself? I think something like 32 percent of Republicans call themselves Trumpist Republicans. And something like 57 percent of them said they're traditional Republicans. How that shapes out, I don't know. Um, but I, I think we should be careful not to mistaken a mobilized, militant minority 
for the party as a whole. And the last thing I'll say on this, just as a comparison, it just reminds me of like there was a big battle in the British Labour Party in the 1970s and the 1980s. And, and you had the rise of what was called the militant, which was a kind of Trotskyist, ultra radical group that seemed to be gaining power. But what was going on around it is that the party was falling apart and the right was on the rise. Um, and I think something similar like that is happening right now, where you have an emboldened minority that is able to do like a lot of material damage. And, and you know, and people should not misunderstand just because you're weak doesn't mean you can't do damage. But whether it is on the kind of a political rise, I just, I, you know, I, I think really remains to be seen. And the fact of the matter is, is that like Trump is the first president since Herbert Hoover, the first president to lose the House, the Senate, and the White House after one term. Like, that's like that's a big deal. You know, one of the comparisons you make is uh, Trump to not just Hoover, but Carter as the last gasp of a dying regime. Do you think the election results that we've seen in the past two years have represented a repudiation of the Reagan neoliberal regime? Or do you think that's just reflective of a repudiation of Trump himself as yeah. this particularly obscene character and uh and, and again as well i mean and, and as a, a a corollary to that if you could uh, uh perhaps articulate your argument that uh trump does not represent trumpism is not a discrete force but instead that is you know the situated squarely within the history of conservatism um i'll take the second first um you know the things that people focus the most on trump and thought were the most um appalling the racism, the lawlessness, the kind of populist, uh, you know, playing, entertaining of violence. So I wrote this book, The Reactionary Mind. It came out in 2011. And that is how I characterize conservatism going back to the very beginning. This was all before Donald Trump was even really on the horizon as a viable political person. So none of those things are really new. And if anything, as I said at the beginning, what seems to to Mark Trump is, is how how he he's not able to craft a kind of hegemonic block, a majoritarian block out of those building those those elements that the right has always used with far more success. Um, so so that's how he sort of fits within the broader uh, parameters and you know the kinds of things that both Tony and Terence are talking about that they're noticing the sort of the the sense of being you know besieged to, to be a kind of a victim of something that's going on this has been like this is the DNA of the right mm -hmm. um, going back from the beginning uh, this is this really is not new um, so so that's what I would say in terms of whether or not this election was a repudiation of the kind of neoliberal regime it wasn't and but that was decided before the election. That was decided when the Democratic Party decided to go with Joe Biden as opposed mm -hmm. to Bernie Sanders. I mean, and and so when we talk about a regime can be very, very weak, which I believe that it is, um, but it won't be repute like it won't. Be, you, you can't fight something with nothing. I mean, and this goes yeah. to the comment um, that I think Terrence raised earlier, like the Democrats do not as of now have. And it's not just policies. It's what Terrence was talking about. It's like a whole narrative. It's a whole story about where, why we are where we are. And if I could just say one, one add one thing to that, because Terrence brought up deindustrialization. Like the problem that the Democrats have around explaining deindustrialization that goes back to the late 1950s and the 1960s, because because it began then. And in fact, it was um, African American leaders who were the you know the first to notice this and, and because it was happening in black communities in the the the, industri the kind of the industrial Midwest in Chicago and Detroit they were last happened. in last in first out exactly and they saw this problem and they said holy shit um, this is really going to uh, you know this is affecting our communities and it's going to affect you guys and what we need and they came up you know with, was the freedom budget which was we need to have an industrial policy. We need to have a kind of massive government hiring and government spending. And the Johnson administration decided, no, we're not going that route. What we're going to do instead is a war on poverty and tax cuts. You know, does that sound familiar? We're going to kind of focus on the people who are, you know, at the, the, like, the, you know, the really at the bottom and give them some, you know, some specific targeted means tested programs and tax cuts. Well, that's been the Democratic Party recipe for a very long time. And so, of course, 
when deindustrialization hit, you know, much broader swaths of American society and white America, the Democrats had no answer and they have continued to have no answer. So this the, this is really the problem we're in is, is that the, the Reaganite neoliberal regime, I do believe, is extraordinarily weak, but the opposition does not yet have a credible narrative, and I should add, the sort of organizational troops, like the people to, to, you know, to make this happen, particularly a labor movement, um, that would, you know, push this tottering house over. And it is tottering. 